This DVD provides information on the recognition of foot and mouth disease, demonstrating the signs likely to be encountered in infected cattle, sheep, goats, pigs, and other even-toed ungulates such as alpacas and other camelids. It also provides information on other diseases of livestock that can mimic or be confused with foot and mouth disease. The DVD also discusses the samples required for diagnosis, along with general information on packaging of samples for transport. Foot and mouth disease is the exotic disease most feared by the Australian livestock industry. An outbreak in Australia would lead to closure of Australian export markets for a range of livestock and livestock products, leading to billions of dollars in losses. The direct economic cost to the United Kingdom of the foot and mouth outbreak in 2001 has been estimated at over three billion pounds sterling, and similar losses could occur if a widespread outbreak occurred in Australia. Early diagnosis of foot and mouth disease is critical. If you suspect this disease, you must report it immediately on 1800 675 888 or contact your local animal health office. The disease would be handled as a national emergency using AusVet Plan as the guide to management of the control and eradication. There are seven different serotypes of foot and mouth disease virus. A, O, C, Asia 1, SAT 1, SAT 2 and SAT 3. Foot and mouth disease virus can infect all even-toed ungulates such as cattle, sheep, pigs and goats and is the most infectious animal disease known. However, not all species are equally susceptible. Even within some foot and mouth disease serotypes, strains of the virus have emerged that have a restricted host range, such as the pig-adapted Cathay topotype found largely in Asia. The characteristic lesions in foot and mouth disease are vesicles, which are fluid-filled blisters. These are formed in all vesicular diseases and can lead to similarities in the clinical signs presented. A striking feature of foot and mouth disease is the speed of development of clinical signs. In pigs exposed naturally to a high-level challenge with type O virus, the first clinical signs can be evident within 24 hours of exposure. Vesicles normally develop within two days of exposure to virus. Spread of infection to animals in contact can also be extremely rapid, with pigs recognised as important amplifying hosts for the virus. Young or weak animals infected with foot and mouth disease virus may die suddenly. In pigs, this mortality can sometimes extend to animals up to six months of age. On post-mortem examination, these animals usually have some areas of necrosis in the heart due to myocarditis and evidence of heart failure. Rarely, sudden death of young animals may be the first indication of an outbreak of foot and mouth disease. In Australia, lameness and vesicular lesions are much more likely to be the first indication of an outbreak. Severely affected adult animals usually survive after developing debilitating lesions that cause considerable suffering as a result of lameness, fever and sometimes loss of appetite due to oral ulceration and inflammation. Pregnant animals may abort and milk yield from lactating animals will usually fall. Under field conditions, foot and mouth disease can be difficult to detect, especially if the animals cannot be restrained properly, preventing examination of the oral cavity, or if the lower legs are heavily soiled. Multiple animals may need to be examined thoroughly before typical lesions are seen. Disease recognition is also complicated if only older healing lesions are present when the disease is first suspected. Lesions in sheep, goats and deer can be hard to detect. This was a major challenge in the foot and mouth disease outbreak in the UK in 2001, since many infected sheep developed inapparent or very mild signs of disease. In sheep, the hair on the legs can obscure lesions on the coronary band. If you suspect any vesicular disease, you must report it immediately to the Emergency Animal Disease Hotline or your nearest animal health office immediately. 
If reporting a suspected case of a vesicular disease, you should obtain instructions about action to take. You and others on the farm should not leave the premises on which the suspected disease has occurred until permission is granted, and only then after appropriate decontamination. Under no circumstances visit another farm or have contact with other animals. You should also prevent animals from leaving the premises and animals from outside the farm entering the premises. The first signs of foot and mouth disease in pigs can occur within 24 hours of exposure to virus. Affected animals appear uncomfortable and reluctant to move. The pigs develop a fever and as a result the skin of white pigs may be reddened. Blanching of the skin at the coronary band can sometimes be detected by this time but can be easily missed. However, it is soon followed by the development of vesicles, especially on the coronary band. These usually rupture within about 24 hours. As the disease develops, the animals prefer to lie down and won't move. Pigs squeal if you pat them or feed them and if you try to move them. Reluctance to move may be harder to detect in pigs reared on soft bedding. Lesions are found around the top of the hooves, on the heels, and between the digits and may extend up the legs. Vesicles sometimes occur in the oral cavity and on the snout, but these are found less frequently than foot lesions and rupture quickly. In lactating animals, lesions may appear on the teats. Within three days of signs of illness first developing, the vesicles on the feet have ruptured, leaving raw ulcerated lesions with tags of epithelium attached. As the disease progresses, lesions at the coronary band can lead to early separation and even sloughing of the claws, especially if the animal is forced to move. The exposed surface of ruptured oral and snout lesions is covered by fibrin and other debris as the healing process commences. Old lesions of foot and mouth disease may be recognised by linear depressions in the claws parallel to the coronary band that form as the pig recovers. The first sign of foot and mouth disease in cattle is often mild lameness and or excessive salivation. Affected animals will usually stop eating, appear dull and listless develop a high fever and may cease lactation. Closer examination of the mouth and feet of affected animals at this early stage will usually reveal intact vesicles containing straw-coloured fluid or, more commonly, ruptured vesicular lesions. Lesions may also develop on the teats or in the nasal passages. By the third day after signs first appear, most of the vesicles have ruptured and from that time onwards the lesions will gradually heal. The rate of healing may be affected by secondary infection. Foot and mouth disease lesions in cattle usually follow a characteristic time course from first appearance until recovery, as shown in the following images of lesions on the tongue. The lesions of foot and mouth disease in sheep and goats can be extremely mild and many animals only develop silent subclinical infection. 
When clinical disease occurs, the main sign seen is lameness. Oral lesions are rarely sufficiently severe to result in excessive salivation. Small vesicles may be detected along the coronary band, and ruptured vesicles may be detected in the oral cavity. Although camelids can be infected experimentally with foot and mouth disease viruses, they appear to have very low susceptibility to the disease, and clinical signs appear to be very mild to non-existent. No carrier state has been detected. Foot and mouth disease in deer can be very difficult to detect clinically. The severity and extent of lesions in infected deer are similar to those in sheep. Experimentally, roe deer were more severely affected than red or fallow deer. Other notifiable viral vesicular diseases in animals, such as vesicular stomatitis, are indistinguishable clinically from foot and mouth disease. If you suspect any vesicular disease, you must report it immediately to the Emergency Animal Disease Hotline or your nearest animal health office. Other diseases in cattle causing oral ulceration may produce clinical signs that can superficially resemble those seen in foot and mouth disease, especially healing lesions. The diseases to consider include vesicular stomatitis, rinderpest, mucosal disease, malignant catarrhal fever, infectious bovine rhinotracheitis, papular stomatitis, and other traumatic lesions to the oral cavity and feet. In pigs, the main diseases causing similar clinical signs are the other vesicular diseases, swine vesicular disease, vesicular exanthema, and vesicular stomatitis, which are not currently present in Australia, and phototoxic dermatitis due to exposure to certain plants. Other diseases that result in ulcers in the oral cavity or on the snout, including oral burns, could also be confused with foot and mouth disease. For young pigs dying from acute heart failure, the main differential diagnoses include infection with encephalomyocarditis virus and possibly mulberry heart disease. In sheep, oral lesions that resemble healing foot and mouth disease lesions are encountered relatively frequently in normal animals. The diseases that have been mistaken for foot and mouth disease include orf or scabby mouth, foot rot, foot scald, blue tongue, and non-specific oral ulceration, often associated with feeding on coarse dry pastures. However, if you have any suspicions about any animal, report it immediately on 1800 675 888 or your local animal health office immediately. Packaging and transport of specimens that may contain infectious material must be performed in a way that does not compromise animal or human health, while ensuring that high quality diagnostic samples are delivered quickly to the laboratory. There are three things that should always be done when packing and transporting specimens that might contain infectious substances. Protect the specimen, protect transport operators, the public and livestock, inform the laboratory. Detection of emergency diseases requires rapid delivery of appropriate specimens that have not deteriorated during transportation. This means that they must be packed in a way that prevents spillage. They should be kept at an appropriate temperature and, if necessary, placed in appropriate transport media. The specimens should then travel without delay to the laboratory. The principles of infectious specimen transport are simple. The goal is to ensure that even if the package is subjected to rough handling during transportation, potentially infectious material in the specimen will not escape. 
This is achieved by using purpose-built, robust specimen transport containers. These usually comprise a primary specimen receptacle, a secondary container, and outer packaging. This is referred to as triple packaging. Generally speaking, the primary receptacle used for specimens should have a screw cap and be leak-proof. If necessary, additional tape or other wrapping can be used to ensure that it is sealed. It can also be placed in a sealed plastic bag for additional protection. All samples must be labelled clearly before packing. The outside of primary receptacles should be disinfected using Vercon spray prior to packing on the farm. The primary receptacle is then placed inside a properly constructed leak-proof secondary container along with a copy of the specimen paperwork and sufficient material to absorb any accidental spillage. This in turn is placed in robust outer packaging. Cool packs, if required, are placed against the secondary container. The outer packaging is sealed and labelled with the required warning labels, plus the addresses and contact numbers for the sender and the receiving laboratory. A copy of the paperwork relating to the specimen is also attached to the outside of the packaging. Legally binding rules have been developed for transport of infectious substances for all modes of transport. These rules change frequently, so this section only presents general guidance on this subject. For air transport, the guidelines issued by IATA, the International Air Transport Association, must be followed. Make sure you always use the latest edition. For road transport, the rules are set by the Australian Dangerous Goods Code. Remember that if you breach these laws and guidelines, you can be prosecuted. All persons packing specimens for air transport must be formally trained. The knowledge and skills of packers need to be updated regularly through refresher training. Before sending a potentially infectious sample for testing for an emergency disease, you should seek permission from the receiving laboratory and advise on transport arrangements. This should cover how it will be sent and when it is expected to arrive. Proper packing of specimens for transport ensures that diagnostic testing can be performed as soon as possible so that no time is lost in diagnosis of emergency diseases. The time and money invested in packing specimens properly ensures that the specimens arrive on time and in good order without creating hazards for others. Remember, foot and mouth disease is notifiable in all states and territories. If you suspect this disease, you must contact the Emergency Animal Disease Hotline on 1800 675 888 or your local animal health office immediately.